Introduction of My Life and Work. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marcetich, Alexandria, Virginia, June 2010. My Life and Work by Henry Ford, in collaboration with Samuel Crowther. Introduction what is the idea? We have only started on our development of our country. We have not as yet, with all our talk of wonderful progress, done more than scratch the surface. The progress has been wonderful enough, but when we compare what we have done with what there is to do, then our past accomplishments are as nothing. When we consider that more power is used merely in plowing the soil, than is used in all the industrial establishments of the country put together, an inkling comes of how much opportunity there is ahead. And now, with so many countries of the world in ferment, and with so much unrest everywhere, is an excellent time to suggest something of the things that may be done in the light of what has been done. When one speaks of increasing power, machinery, and industry, there comes up a picture of cold, metallic sort of world, in which great factories will drive away the trees, the flowers, the birds, and the green fields, and that then we shall have a world composed of metal machines and human machines. With all of that, I do not agree. I think that unless we know more about machines and their use, unless we better understand the mechanical portion of life, we cannot have the time to enjoy the trees and the birds and the flowers and the green fields. I think that we have already done too much toward banishing the pleasant things from life by thinking that there is some opposition between living and providing the means of living. We waste so much time and energy that we have little left over in which to enjoy ourselves. Power and machinery, money and goods, are useful only as they set us free to live. They are but means to an end. For instance, I do not consider the machines which bear my name simply as machines. If that was all there was to it, I would do something else. I take them as concrete evidence of the working out of a theory of business, which I hope is something more than a theory of business, a theory that looks toward making this world a better place in which to live. The fact that the commercial success of the Ford Motor Company has been most unusual is important only because it serves to demonstrate, in a way which no one can fail to understand, that the theory to date is right. Considered solely in this light, I can criticize the prevailing system of industry and the organization of money and society from the standpoint of one who has not been beaten by them. As things are now organized, I could, were I thinking only selfishly, ask for no change. If I merely want money, the present system is all right. It gives money in plenty to me. But I am thinking of service. The present system does not permit of the best service because it encourages every kind of waste. It keeps many men from getting the full return from service. And it is going nowhere. It is all a matter of better planning and adjustment. I have no quarrel with the general attitude of scoffing at new ideas. It is better to be skeptical of all new ideas and to insist upon being shown rather than to rush around in a continuous brainstorm after every new idea. Skepticism, if by that we mean cautiousness, is the balance wheel of civilization. Most of the present acute troubles of the world arise out of taking on new ideas without first carefully investigating to discover if they are good ideas. An idea is not necessarily good because it is old, or necessarily bad because it is new, but if an old idea works, then the weight of the evidence is all in its favor. Ideas are of themselves extraordinarily valuable, but an idea is just an idea. Almost anyone can think up an idea, 
The thing that counts is developing it into a practical product. I am now most interested in fully demonstrating that the ideas we have put into practice are capable of the largest application, that they have nothing peculiarly to do with motor cars or tractors, but form something in the nature of a universal code. I am quite certain that it is the natural code, and I want to demonstrate it so thoroughly that it will be accepted, not as a new idea, but as a natural code. The natural thing to do is to work, to recognize that prosperity and happiness can be obtained only through honest effort. Human ills flow largely from attempting to escape from this natural course. I have no suggestion which goes beyond accepting in its fullest this principle of nature. I take it for granted that we must work. All that we have done comes as the result of a certain insistence that since we must work, it is better to work intelligently and forehandedly, that the better we do our work, the better off we shall be. All of which I conceive to be merely elemental common sense. I am not a reformer. I think there is entirely too much attempt at reforming in the world, and that we pay too much attention to reformers. We have two kinds of reformers. Both are nuisances. The man who calls himself a reformer wants to smash things. He is the sort of man who would tear up a whole shirt because the collar button did not fit the buttonhole. It would never occur to him to enlarge the buttonhole. This sort of reformer never under any circumstances knows what he is doing. Experience and reform do not go together. A reformer cannot keep his zeal at white heat in the presence of a fact. He must discard all facts. Since 1914, a great many persons have received brand new intellectual outfits. Many are beginning to think for the first time. They open their eyes and realize that they were in the world. Then, with a thrill of independence, they realize that they could look at the world critically. They did so and found it faulty. The intoxication of assuming the masterful position of a critic of the social system, which it is every man's right to assume, is unbalancing at first. The very young critic is very much unbalanced. He is strongly in favor of wiping out the old order and starting a new one. They actually managed to start a new world in Russia. It is there that the work of the world makers can best be studied. We learn from Russia that it is the minority and not the majority who determine destructive action. We learn also that while men may decree social laws in conflict with natural laws, nature vetoes those laws more ruthlessly than did the czars. Nature has vetoed the whole Soviet Republic, for it sought to deny nature. It denied, above all else, the right to the fruits of labor. Some people say, Russia will have to go to work. But that does not describe the case. The fact is that poor Russia is at work, but her work counts for nothing. It is not free work. In the United States, a workman works eight hours a day. In Russia, he works twelve to fourteen. In the United States, if a workman wishes to lay off a day or a week and is able to afford it, there is nothing to prevent him. In Russia, under Sovietism, the workman goes to work whether he wants to or not. The freedom of the citizen has disappeared in the discipline of a prison-like monotony in which all are treated alike. That is slavery. Freedom is the right to work a decent length of time, and to get a decent living for doing so, to be able to arrange the little personal details of one's own life. It is the aggregate of these and many other items of freedom which makes up the great idealistic freedom. The minor forms of freedom lubricate the everyday life of all of us. Russia could not get along without intelligence and experience. As soon as she began to run her factories by committees, they went to rack and ruin. 
there was more debate than production. As soon as they threw out the skilled man, thousands of tons of precious materials were spoiled. The fanatics talked the people into starvation. The Soviets are now offering the engineers, the administrators, the foremen and superintendents, whom at first they drove out, large sums of money, if only they will come back. Bolshevism is now crying for the brains and experience which it yesterday treated so ruthlessly. All that reform did to Russia was to block production. There is, in this country, a sinister element that desires to creep in between the men who work with their hands and the men who think and plan for the men who work with their hands. The same influence that drove the brains, experience, and ability out of Russia is busily engaged in raising prejudice here. We must not suffer the stranger, the destroyer, the hater of happy humanity, to divide our people. In unity is American strength and freedom. On the other hand, we have a different kind of reformer who calls himself one. He is singularly like the radical reformer. The radical has no experience and does not want it. The other class of reformer has had plenty of experience, but it does him no good. I refer to the reactionary, who will be surprised to find himself put in exactly the same class as the Bolshevist. He wants to go back to some previous condition, not because it was the best condition, but because he thinks he knows about that condition. The one crowd wants to smash up the whole world in order to make a better one. The other holds the world as so good that it might well be let stand as it is, and decay. The second notion arises as does the first, out of not using the eyes to see with. It is perfectly possible to smash this world, but it is not possible to build a new one. It is possible to prevent the world from going forward, but it is not possible then to bring it from going back, from decaying. It is foolish to expect that, if everything be overturned, everyone will thereby get three meals a day, or, should everything be petrified, that thereby six percent interest may be paid. The trouble is that reformers and reactionaries alike get away from the realities, from the primary functions. One of the counsels of caution is to be very certain that we do not mistake a reactionary turn for a return of common sense. We have passed through a period of fireworks of every description and the making of a great many idealistic maps of progress. We did not get anywhere. It was a convention, not a march. Lovely things were said, but when we got home we found the furnace out. Reactionaries have frequently taken advantage of the recoil from such a period, and they have promised the good old times, which usually means the bad old abuses, and because they are perfectly void of vision, they are sometimes regarded as practical men. Their return to power is often hailed as the return of common sense. The primary functions are agriculture, manufacture, and transportation. Community life is impossible without them. They hold the world together. Raising things, making things, and earning things are as primitive as human need, and yet as modern as anything can be. They are of the essence of physical life. When they cease, community life ceases. Things do get out of shape in this present world under the present system, but we may hope for a betterment if the foundations stand sure. The great delusion is that one may change the foundation, usurp the part of destiny in the social process, the foundations of society are the men and means to grow things, to make things, and to carry things. As long as agriculture, manufacture, and transportation survive, the world can survive any economic or social change. As we serve our jobs, we serve the world. 
There is plenty of work to do. Business is merely work. Speculation in things already produced, that is not business. It is more or less respectable graft. But it cannot be legislated out of existence. Laws can do very little. Law never does anything constructive. It can never be more than a policeman, and so it is a waste of time to look to our state capitals or to Washington to do that which law was not designed to do. As long as we look to legislation to cure poverty or to abolish special privilege, we are going to see poverty spread and special privilege grow. We have had enough of looking to Washington, and we have had enough of legislators. Not so much, however, in this as in other countries, promising laws to do that which laws cannot do. When you get a whole country, as did ours, thinking that Washington is a sort of heaven and behind its clouds dwell omniscience and omnipotence, you are educating that country into a dependent state of mind which augurs ill for the future. Our help does not come from Washington, but from ourselves. Our help may, however, go to Washington as a sort of central distribution point where all our efforts are coordinated for the general good. We may help the government. The government cannot help us. The slogan of less government in business and more business in government is a very good one not mainly on account of business or government, but on account of the people. Business is not the reason why the United States was founded. The Declaration of Independence is not a business charter, nor is the Constitution of the United States a commercial schedule. The United States, its land, people, government, and business, are but methods by which the life of the people is made worth while. The government is a servant and never should be anything but a servant. The moment the people become adjuncts to government, then the law of retribution begins to work. For such a relation is unnatural, immoral, and inhuman. We cannot live without business, and we cannot live without government. Business and government are necessary as servants, like water and grain. As masters, they overturn the natural order. The welfare of the country is squarely up to us as individuals. This is where it should be, and that is where it is safest. Governments can promise something for nothing, but they cannot deliver. They can juggle the currencies as they did in Europe, and as bankers the world over do, as long as they can get the benefits of the juggling, with a patter of solemn nonsense. But it is work, and work alone, that can continue to deliver the goods, and that, down in his heart, is what every man knows. There is little chance of an intelligent people, such as ours, ruining the fundamental process of economic life. Most men know they cannot get something for nothing. Most men feel, even if they do not know, that money is not wealth. The ordinary theories which promise everything to everybody and demand nothing from anybody are promptly denied by the instincts of the ordinary man, even when he does not find reasons against them. He knows that they are wrong. That is enough. The present order, always clumsy, often stupid, and in many ways imperfect, has this advantage over any other. It works. Doubtless our order will merge by degrees into another, and the new one will also work, but not so much by reason of what it is as by reason of what men will bring into it. The reason why Bolshevism did not work, and cannot work, is not economic. It does not matter whether industry is privately managed or socially controlled. It does not matter whether you call the workers' share wages or dividends. It does not matter whether you regimentalize the people as to food, clothing, and shelter, 
or whether you allow them to eat, dress, and live as they like. Those are mere matters of detail. The incapacity of the Bolshevist leaders is indicated by the fuss they made over such details. Bolshevism failed because it was both unnatural and immoral. Our system stands. Is it wrong? Of course it is wrong, at a thousand points. Is it clumsy? Of course it is clumsy. By all right and reason, it ought to break down. But it does not, because it is instinct with certain economic and moral fundamentals. The economic fundamental is labor. Labor is the human element which makes the fruitful seasons of the earth useful to men. It is men's labor that makes the harvest what it is. That is the economic fundamental. Every one of us is working with material which we did not and could not create, but which was presented to us by nature. The moral fundamental is man's right in his labor. This is variously stated. It is sometimes called the right of property. It is sometimes masked in the command, Thou shalt not steal. It is the other man's right in his property that makes stealing a crime. When a man has earned his bread, he has the right to that bread. If another steals it, he does more than steal bread. He invades a sacred human right. If we cannot produce, we cannot have. But some say, if we produce, it is only for the capitalists, Capitalists who become such because they provide better means of production are of the foundation of society. They have really nothing of their own. They merely manage property for the benefit of others. Capitalists who become such through trading in money are a temporarily necessary evil. They may not be evil at all if their money goes to production. If their money goes to complicating distribution, to raising barriers between the producer and the consumer, then they are evil capitalists and they will pass away when money is better adjusted to work. And money will become better adjusted to work when it is fully realized that through work and work alone may health, wealth, and happiness inevitably be secured. There is no reason why a man who is willing to work should not be able to work and receive the full value of his work. There is equally no reason why a man who can but will not work should not receive the full value of his services to the community. He should most certainly be permitted to take away from the community an equivalent of what he contributes to it. If he contributes nothing, he should take away nothing. He should have the freedom of starvation. We are not getting anywhere when we insist that every man ought to have more than he deserves to have, just because some do get more than they deserve to have. There can be no greater absurdity and no greater disservice to humanity in general than to insist that all men are equal. Most certainly all men are not equal, and any democratic conception which strives to make men equal is only an effort to block progress. Men cannot be of equal service. The men of larger ability are less numerous than the men of smaller ability. It is possible for a mass of the smaller men to pull the larger ones down, but in so doing they pull themselves down. It is the larger men who give the leadership to the community and enable the smaller men to live with less effort. The conception of democracy which names a leveling down of ability makes for waste. No two things in nature are alike. We build our cars absolutely interchangeable. All parts are as nearly alike as chemical analysis. The finest machinery and the finest workmanship can make them. No fitting of any kind is required, and it would certainly seem that two Fords standing side by side, looking exactly alike, and made so exactly alike, that any part could be taken out of one and put into the other, would be alike. 
but they are not. They will have different road habits. We have men who have driven hundreds, and in some cases thousands of Fords, and they say that no two ever act precisely the same, that, if they should drive a new car for an hour, or even less, and then the car were mixed with a bunch of other new ones, also each driven for a single hour, and under the same conditions, that although they could not recognize the car they had been driving merely by looking at it, they could do so by driving it. I have been speaking in general terms. Let us be more concrete. A man ought to be able to live on a scale commensurate with the service that he renders. This is rather a good time to talk about this point, for we have recently been through a period when the rendering of service was the last thing that most people thought of. We were getting to a place where no one cared about costs or service. Orders came without effort. Whereas once it was the customer who favored the merchant by dealing with him, conditions changed until it was the merchant who favored the customer by selling to him. That is bad for business. Monopoly is bad for business. Profiteering is bad for business. The lack of necessity to hustle is bad for business. Business is never as healthy as when, like a chicken, it must do a certain amount of scratching for what it gets. Things were coming too easily. There was a letdown of the principle that an honest relation ought to obtain between values and prices. The public no longer had to be catered to. There was even a public-be-damned attitude in many places. It was intensely bad for business. Some men called that abnormal condition prosperity. It was not prosperity. It was just a needless money chase. Money chasing is not business. It is very easy, unless one keeps a plan thoroughly in mind, to get burdened with money and then, in an effort to make more money, to forget all about selling to the people what they want. Business on a money-making basis is most insecure. It is a touch-and-go affair, moving irregularly and rarely over a term of years amounting to much. It is the function of business to produce for consumption and not for money or speculation. Producing for consumption implies that the quality of the article produced will be high and that the price will be low that the article be one which serves the people, and not merely the producer. If the money feature is twisted out of its proper perspective, then the production will be twisted to serve the producer. The producer depends for his prosperity upon serving the people. He may get by for a while serving himself, but if he does, it will be purely accidental and when the people wake up to the fact that they are not being served, the end of that producer is in sight. During the boom period, the larger effort of production was to serve itself, and hence, the moment the people wake up, many producers went to smash. They said that they had entered into a period of depression. Really, they had not. They were simply trying to pit nonsense against sense, which is something that cannot successfully be done. Being greedy for money is the surest way not to get it, but when one serves for the sake of service, for the satisfaction of doing that which one believes to be right, then money abundantly takes care of itself. Money comes naturally as the result of service and it is absolutely necessary to have money. But we do not want to forget that the end of money is not ease, but the opportunity to perform more service. In my mind, nothing is more abhorrent than a life of ease. None of us has any right to ease. There is no place in civilization for the idler. Any scheme looking to abolishing money is only making affairs more complex, for we must have a measure. 
that our present system of money is a satisfactory basis for exchange is a matter of grave doubt. That is a question which I shall talk of in a subsequent chapter. The gist of my objection to the present monetary system is that it tends to become a thing of itself and to block instead of facilitate production. My effort is in the direction of simplicity. People in general have so little and it costs so much to buy even the barest necessities, let alone that share of the luxuries to which I think everyone is entitled. Because nearly everything that we make is much more complex than it needs to be. Our clothing, our food, our household furnishings, all could be much simpler than they now are, and at the same time be better looking. Things in past ages were made in certain ways, and makers since then have just followed. I do not mean that we should adopt freak styles. There is no necessity for that clothing need not be a bag with a hole cut in it. That might be easy to make but it would be inconvenient to wear. A blanket does not require much tailoring, but none of us could get much work done if we went around Indian fashion in blankets. Real simplicity means that which gives the very best service and is the most convenient in use. The trouble with drastic reforms is they always insist that a man be made over in order to use certain designed articles. I think that dress reform for women, which seems to mean ugly clothes, must always originate with plain women who want to make everyone else look plain. That is not the right process. Start with an article that suits, and then study to find some way of eliminating the entirely useless parts. This applies to everything a shoe, a dress, a house, a piece of machinery, a railroad, a steamship, an airplane, as we cut out useless parts and simplify necessary ones, we also cut down the cost of making. This is simple logic, but oddly enough the ordinary process starts with a cheapening of the manufacturing instead of with a simplifying of the article. The start ought to be with the article. First we ought to find whether it is as well made as it should be. Does it give the best possible service? Then, are the materials the best or merely the most expensive? Then, can its complexity and weight be cut down? And so on. There is no more sense in having extra weight in an article than there is in the cockade on a coachman's hat. In fact, there is not as much. For the cockade, we may help the coachman to identify his hat, while the extra weight means only a waste of strength. I cannot imagine where the delusion that weight means strength came from. It is all well enough in a pile driver, but why move a heavy weight if we are not going to hit anything with it? In transportation, why put extra weight in a machine? Why not add it to the load that the machine is designed to carry? Fat men cannot run as fast as thin men, but we build most of our vehicles as though dead weight fat increase speed. A deal of poverty grows out of the carriage of excess weight. Some day we shall discover how further to eliminate weight. Take wood, for example. For certain purposes, wood is now the best substance we know, but wood is extremely wasteful. The wood in a Ford car contains 30 pounds of water. There must be some way of doing better than that. There must be some method by which we can gain the same strength and elasticity without having to lug useless weight, and so through a thousand processes. The farmer makes too complex an affair out of his daily work. I believe that the average farmer puts to a really useful purpose only about 5% of the energy that he spends. If anyone ever equipped a factory in the style, say, 
the average farm is fitted out, the place would be cluttered with men. The worst factory in Europe is hardly as bad as the average farm barn. Power is utilized to the least possible degree. Not only is everything done by hand, but seldom is a thought given to logical arrangement. A farmer doing his chores will walk up and down a rickety ladder a dozen times. He will carry water for years instead of putting in a few lengths of pipe. His whole idea, when there is extra work to do, is to hire extra men. He thinks of putting money into improvements as an expense. Farm products at their lowest prices are dearer than they ought to be. Farm profits at their highest are lower than they ought to be. It is waste motion, waste effort, that makes farm prices high and profits low. On my own farm at Dearborn, we do everything by machinery. We have eliminated a great number of wastes, but we have not as yet touched on real economy. We have not been able to put in five or ten years of intense night and day study to discover what really ought to be done. We have left more undone than we have done. Yet at no time, no matter what the value of crops, have we failed to turn a first-class profit. We are not farmers. We are industrialists on the farm. The moment the farmer considers himself an industrialist, with a horror of waste either in material or in men, then we are going to have farm products so low priced that all will have enough to eat and the profits will be so satisfactory that farming will be considered as among the least hazardous and most profitable of occupations. Lack of knowledge of what is going on and lack of knowledge of what the job really is and the best way of doing it are the reasons why farming is thought not to pay. Nothing could pay the way farming is conducted. The farmer follows his luck and his forefathers. He does not know how economically to produce, and he does not know how to market. A manufacturer who knew how neither to produce nor to market would not long stay in business. That the farmer can stay on shows how wonderfully profitable farming can be. The way to attain low-priced, high-volume production in the factory or on the farm, and low-priced, high-volume production means plenty for everyone, is quite simple. The trouble is that the general tendency is to complicate very simple affairs. Take, for instance, an improvement. When we talk about improvements, usually we have in mind some change in a product. An improved product is one that has been changed. That is not my idea. I do not believe in starting to make until I have discovered the best possible thing. This, of course, does not mean that a product should never be changed, but I think that it will be found more economical in the end not even to try to produce an article until you have fully satisfied yourself that utility, design, and material are the best. If your researches do not give you that confidence, then keep right on searching until you find confidence. The place to start manufacturing is with the article. The factory, the organization, the selling, and the financial plans will shape themselves to the article. You will have a cutting edge on your business chisel, and in the end you will save time. Rushing into manufacture without being certain of the product is the unrecognized cause of many business failures. People seem to think that the big thing is the factory, or the store, or the financial backing, or the management. The big thing is the product, and any hurry into getting into fabrication before designs are completed is just so much waste time. I spent twelve years before I had a Model T, which is what is known today as the Ford car, 
that suited me. We did not attempt to go into real production until we had a real product. The product has not been essentially changed. We are constantly experimenting with new ideas. If you travel the roads in the neighborhood of Dearborn, you can still find all sorts of models of Ford cars. They are experimental cars. They are not new models. I do not believe in letting any good idea get by me, but I will not quickly decide whether an idea is good or bad. If an idea seems good or seems even to have possibilities, I believe in doing whatever is necessary to test out the idea from every angle. But testing out the idea is something very different from making a change in the car. Where most manufacturers find themselves quicker to make a change in the product than in the method of manufacturing, we follow exactly the opposite course. Our big changes have been in methods of manufacturing. They never stand still. I believe that there is hardly a single operation in the making of our car that is the same as when we made our first car of the present model. That is why we make them so cheaply. The few changes that have been made in the car have been in the direction of convenience in use, or where we found that a change in design might give added strength. The materials in the car change as we learn more and more about materials. Also, we do not want to be held up in production or have the expense of production increased by any possible shortage in a particular material. So we have, for most parts, worked out substitute materials. Vanadium steel, for instance, is our principal steel. With it, we can get the greatest strength with the least weight, but it would not be good business to let our whole future depend upon being able to get vanadium steel. We have worked out a substitute. All our steels are special, but for every one of them we have at least one, and sometimes several, fully proved and tested substitutes. And so on through all our materials, and likewise with our parts. In the beginning we made very few of our parts and none of our motors. Now we make all our motors, and for most our parts, because we find it cheaper to do so. But also, we aim to make some of every part so that we cannot be caught in any market emergency or be crippled by some outside manufacturer being unable to fill his orders. The prices on glass were run up outrageously high during the war. We are among the largest users of glass in the country. Now we are putting up our own glass factory. If we had devoted all of this energy to making changes in the product, we should be nowhere. But by not changing the product, we are able to give our energy to the improvement of the making. The principal part of a chisel is the cutting edge. If there is a single principle on which our business rests, it is that. It makes no difference how finely made a chisel is, or what splendid steel it has, or in how well it is forged. If it has no cutting edge, it is not a chisel. It is just a piece of metal. All of which being translated means that it is what a thing does, not what it is supposed to do, that matters. What is the use of putting a tremendous force behind a blunt chisel if a light blow on a sharp chisel will do the work? The chisel is there to cut, not to be hammered. The hammering is only incidental to the job. So if we want to work, why not concentrate on the work and do it in the quickest possible fashion? The cutting edge of merchandising is the point where the product touches the consumer. An unsatisfactory product is one that has a dull cutting edge. A lot of waste effort is needed to put it through. 
The cutting edge of a factory is the man and the machine on the job. If the man is not right, the machine cannot be. If the machine is not right, the man cannot be. For any one to be required to use more force than is absolutely necessary for the job in hand is waste. The essence of my idea, then, is that waste and greed block the delivery of true service. Both waste and greed are unnecessary. Waste is due largely to not understanding what one does or being careless in doing of it. Greed is merely a species of nearsightedness. I have striven toward manufacturing with a minimum of waste both of materials and of human effort, and then toward distribution at a minimum of profit, depending for the total profit upon the volume of distribution. In the process of manufacturing, I want to distribute the maximum of wage, that is, the maximum of buying power, since also this makes for a minimum cost and we sell at a minimum profit we can distribute a product in consonance with buying power. Thus, everyone who is connected with us, either as a manager, worker, or purchaser, is the better for our existence. The institution that we have erected is performing a service. That is the only reason I have for talking about it. The principles of that service are these. 1 an absence of fear of the future and of veneration for the past. One who fears the future, who fears failure, limits his activities. Failure is only the opportunity more intelligently to begin again. There is no disgrace in honest failure. There is disgrace in fearing to fail. What is past is useful only as it suggests ways and means for progress. 2. A disregard of competition. Whoever does a thing best ought to be the one to do it. It is criminal to try to get business away from another man. Criminal, because one is then trying to lower for personal gain the condition of one's fellow man, to rule by force instead of by intelligence. 3. The putting of service before profit. Without a profit, business cannot extend. There is nothing inherently wrong about making a profit. Well-conducted business enterprise cannot fail to return a profit, but profit must and inevitably will come as a reward for good service. It cannot be the basis. It must be the result of service. 4. Manufacturing is not buying low and selling high. It is the process of buying materials fairly and, with the smallest possible addition of cost, transforming those materials into a consumable product and giving it to the consumer. Gambling, speculating, and sharp dealing tend only to clog this progression. How all of this arose how it has worked out, and how it applies generally are the subjects of these chapters. End of Introduction Of My Life and Work This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marcetich, Alexandria, Virginia, June 2010. My Life and Work by Henry Ford, in collaboration with Samuel Crowther. Chapter 1. The Beginning of Business. On May 31, 1921, the Ford Motor Company turned out car number 5 million. It is out in my museum along with the gasoline buggy that I began work on 30 years before 
and which first ran satisfactorily along in the spring of 1893. I was running it when the bobolinks came to Dearborn, and they always come on April 2nd. There is all the difference in the world in the appearance of the two vehicles, and almost as much difference in construction and materials, but in fundamentals the two are curiously alike, except that the old buggy has on it a few wrinkles that we have not yet quite adopted in our modern car. For that first car or buggy, even though it had but two cylinders, would make twenty miles an hour and run sixty miles on three gallons of gas the little tank held, and is as good today as the day it was built. The development in methods of manufacture and in materials has been greater than the development in basic design. The whole design has been refined. The present Ford car, which is the Model T, has four cylinders and a self-starter. It is in every way a more convenient and an easier riding car. It is simpler than the first car, but almost every point in it may be found also in the first car. The changes have been brought about through experience in the making and not through any change in the basic principle, which I take to be an important fact, demonstrating that, given a good idea to start with, it is better to concentrate on perfecting it than to hunt around for a new idea. One idea at a time is about as much as anyone can handle. It was life on the farm that drove me into devising ways and means to better transportation. I was born on July 30, 1863, on a farm at Dearborn, Michigan, and my earliest recollection is that, considering the results, there was too much work on the place. That is the way I still feel about farming. There is a legend that my parents were very poor, and that the early days were hard ones. Certainly, they were not rich, but neither were they poor. As Michigan farmers went, we were prosperous. The house in which I was born is still standing, and it and the farm are part of my present holding. There was too much hard hand labor on our own and all other farms of the time. Even when I was very young, I suspected that much might somehow be done in a better way. That is what took me into mechanics, although my mother always said that I was born a mechanic. I had a kind of workshop with odds and ends of metal for tools before I had anything else. In those days, we did not have the toys of today. What we had were homemade. My toys were all tools. They still are, and every fragment of machinery was a treasure. The biggest event of those early years was meeting with a road engine about eight miles out of Detroit one day, when we were driving to town. I was then twelve years old. The second biggest event was getting a watch, which happened in the same year. I remember that engine as though I had seen it only yesterday, for it was the first vehicle other than horse-drawn that I had ever seen. It was intended primarily for driving threshing machines and sawmills, and was simply a portable engine and boiler mounted on wheels, with a water tank and coal cart trailing behind. I had seen plenty of these engines hauled around by horses, but this one had a chain that made a connection between the engine and the rear wheels of the wagon-like frame on which the boiler was mounted. The engine was placed over the boiler, and one man standing on the platform behind the boiler shoveled coal, managed the throttle, and did the steering. It had been made by Nichols, Shepard, and Company of Battle Creek. I found that out at once. The engine had stopped to let us pass with our horses, and I was off the wagon and talking to the engineer before my father, who was driving, knew what I was up to. The engineer was very glad to explain the whole affair. He was proud of it. He showed me how the chain was disconnected from the propelling wheel, and a belt put on to drive other machinery. He told me that the engine made 200 revolutions a minute, and that the chain pinion 
could be shifted to let the wagon stop while the engine was still running. This last is a feature which, although in different fashion, is incorporated into modern automobiles. It was not important with steam engines, which are easily stopped and started, but it became very important with the gasoline engine. It was that engine which took me into automotive transportation. I tried to make models of it, and some years later I did make one that ran very well, but from the time I saw that road engine as a boy of twelve right forward to today, my great interest has been in making a machine that would travel the roads. Driving to town, I always had a pocket full of trinkets, nuts, washers, and odds and ends of machinery. Often I took a broken watch and tried to put it together. When I was thirteen, I managed for the first time to put a watch together so that it would keep time. By the time I was fifteen, I could do almost anything in watch repairing, although my tools were of the crudest. There is an immense amount to be learned simply by tinkering with things. It is not possible to learn from books how everything is made, and a real mechanic ought to know how nearly everything is made. Machines are to a mechanic what books are to a writer. He gets ideas from them, and if he has any brains, he will apply those ideas. From the beginning, I never could work up much interest in the labor of farming. I wanted to have something to do with machinery. My father was not entirely in sympathy with my bent towards mechanics. He thought that I ought to be a farmer. When I left school at seventeen and became an apprentice in the machine shop of the dry dock engine works, I was all but given up for lost. I passed my apprenticeship without trouble. That is, I was qualified to be a machinist long before my three-year term had expired, and having a liking for fine work and a leaning towards watches, I worked nights at repairing in a jewelry shop. At one point of those early years, I think that I must have had fully three hundred watches, I thought I could build a serviceable watch for around 30 cents and nearly started in the business, but I did not because I figured out that watches were not universal necessities and therefore people generally would not buy them. Just how I reached that surprising conclusion I am unable to state. I did not like the ordinary jewelry and watchmaking work excepting where the job was hard to do. Even then, I wanted to make something in quantity. It was just about the time when the standard railroad time was being arranged. We had formerly been on sun time, and for quite a while, just as in our present daylight saving days, the railroad time differed from the local time. That bothered me a good deal and so I succeeded in making a watch that kept both times. It had two dials, and it was quite a curiosity in the neighborhood. In 1879, that is, about four years after I first saw that Nichols Shepherd machine, I managed to get a chance to run one, and when my apprenticeship was over, I worked with a local representative of the Westinghouse Company of Schenectady, as an expert in the setting up and repair of the road engines. The engine they put out was much the same as the Nichols Shepherd engine, excepting that the engine was up in front, the boiler in the rear, and the power was applied to the back wheels by a belt. They could make 12 miles an hour on the road, even though the self-propelling feature was only an incident of the construction. They were sometimes used as tractors to pull heavy loads and, if the owner also happened to be in the threshing machine business, he hitched his threshing machine and other paraphernalia to the engine in moving from farm to farm. What bothered me was the weight and the cost. They weighed a couple of tons and were far too expensive to be owned by other than a farmer with a great deal of land. 
they were mostly employed by people who went into threshing as a business or who had sawmills or some other line that required portable power even before that time i had the idea of making some kind of a light steam car that would take the place of horses more especially however as a tractor to attend to the excessively hard labor of ploughing it occurred to me as i remember somewhat vaguely that precisely the same idea might be applied to a carriage or a wagon on the road a horseless carriage was a common idea people had been talking about carriages without horses for many years back in fact ever since the steam engine was invented but the idea of the carriage at first did not seem so practical to me as the idea of an engine to do the harder farm work and of all the work on the farm ploughing was the hardest our roads were poor and we had not the habit of getting around one of the most remarkable features of the automobile on the farm is the way that it has broadened the farmer's life we simply took for granted that unless the errand were urgent we would not go to town and i think we rarely made more than a trip a week in bad weather we did not even go that often being a full-fledged machinist and with a very fair workshop on the farm it was not difficult for me to build a steam wagon or tractor in the building of it came the idea that perhaps it might be made for road use i felt perfectly certain that horses considering all the bother of attending them and the expense of feeding did not earn their keep the obvious thing to do was to design and build a steam engine that would be light enough to run an ordinary wagon or pull a plow i thought it more important first to develop the tractor to lift farm drudgery off flesh and blood and lay it on steel and motors has been my most constant ambition it was circumstances that took me first into the actual manufacture of road cars i found eventually that people were more interested in something that would travel on the road than in something that would do the work on the farms in fact i doubt that the light farm tractor could have been introduced on the farm had not the farmer had his eyes opened slowly but surely by the automobile but that is getting ahead of the story i thought the farmer would be more interested in the tractor i built a steam car that ran it had a kerosene heated boiler and it developed plenty of power and a neat control which is so easy with a steam throttle but the boiler was dangerous to get the requisite power without too big and heavy a power plant required that the engine work under high pressure sitting on a high pressure steam boiler is not altogether pleasant to make it even reasonably safe required an excess of weight that nullified the economy of the high pressure for two years i kept experimenting with various sorts of boilers the engine and control problems were simple enough and then i definitely abandoned the whole idea of running a road vehicle by steam i knew that in england they had what amounted to locomotives running on the roads hauling lines of trailers and also there was no difficulty in designing a big steam tractor for use on a large farm but ours were not then english roads they would have stalled or racked to pieces the strongest and heaviest road tractor and anyway the manufacture of a big tractor which only a few wealthy farmers could buy did not seem to me worth while but i did not give up the idea of a horseless carriage the work with the westinghouse representative only served to confirm the opinion i had formed that steam was not suitable for light vehicles that is why i stayed only a year with that company there was nothing more that the big steam tractors and engines could teach me and i did not want to waste time on something that would lead nowhere a few years before it was while i was an apprentice 
I read in The World of Science, an English publication, of the silent gas engine, which was then coming out in England. I think it was the auto engine. It ran with illuminating gas, had a large cylinder, and the power impulses being thus intermittent required an extremely heavy flywheel. As far as weight was concerned, it gave nothing like the power per pound of metal that a steam engine gave, and the use of illuminating gas seemed to dismiss it as even a possibility for road use. It was interesting to me only as all machinery was interesting. I followed in the English and American magazines which we got in the shop the development of the engine and most particularly the hints of the possible replacement of the illuminating gas fuel by a gas formed by the vaporization of gasoline. The idea of gas engines was by no means new, but this was the first time that a really serious effort had been made to put them on the market. They were received with interest rather than enthusiasm, and I do not recall anyone who thought that the internal combustion engine could ever have more than a limited use. All the wise people demonstrated conclusively that the engine could not compete with steam. They never thought that it might carve out a career for itself. That is the way with wise people. They are so wise and practical that they always know to a dot just why something cannot be done. They always know the limitations. That is why I never employ an expert in full bloom. If I ever wanted to kill opposition by unfair means, I would endow the opposition with experts. They would have so much good advice that I could be sure they would do little work. The gas engine interested me, and I followed its progress, but only from curiosity, until about 1885 or 1886, when, the steam engine being discarded as the motive power for the carriage that I intended some day to build, I had to look around for another sort of motive power. In 1885, I repaired an auto engine at the Eagle Iron Works in Detroit. No one in town knew anything about them. There was a rumor that I did, and, although I had never before been in contact with one, I undertook and carried through the job. That gave me a chance to study the new engine at first hand, and in 1887, I built one on the Otto four-cycle model just to see if I understood the principles. Four-cycle means that the piston traverses the cylinder four times to get one power impulse. The first stroke draws in the gas, the second compresses it, the third is the explosion or power stroke, while the fourth stroke exhausts the waste gas. The little model worked well enough, it had a one-inch bore and a three-inch stroke, operated with gasoline, and while it did not develop much power, it was slightly larger in proportion than the engines being offered commercially. I gave it away later to a young man who wanted it for something or other and whose name I have forgotten. It was eventually destroyed. That was the beginning of the work with the internal combustion engine. I was then on the farm, to which I had returned, more because I wanted to experiment than because I wanted to farm, and, now being an all-around machinist, I had a first-class workshop to replace the toy shop of earlier days. My father offered me forty acres of timberland, provided I gave up being a machinist. I agreed in a provisional way, for cutting the timber gave me a chance to get married. I fitted out a sawmill and a portable engine and started to cut out and saw up the timber on the tract. Some of the first of that lumber went into a cottage on my new farm, and in it we began our married life. It was not a big house, 31 feet square and only a story and a half high, but it was a comfortable place. I added it to my workshop, and when I was not cutting timber, 
I was working on the gas engines, learning what they were and how they acted. I read everything I could find, but the greatest knowledge came from the work. A gas engine is a mysterious sort of thing. It will not always go the way it should. You can imagine how those first engines acted. It was in 1890 that I began on a double-cylinder engine. It was quite impractical to consider the single cylinder for transportation purposes. The flywheel had to be entirely too heavy. Between making the first four-cycle engine of the auto type and the start on a double cylinder, I had made a great many experimental engines out of tubing. I fairly knew my way about. The double cylinder, I thought, could be applied to a road vehicle, and my original idea was to put it on a bicycle with a direct connection to the crankshaft and allowing for the rear wheel of the bicycle to act as the balance wheel. The speed was going to be varied only by the throttle. I never carried out this plan because it soon became apparent that the engine, gasoline tank, and the various necessary controls would be entirely too heavy for a bicycle. The plan of the two opposed cylinders was that, while one would be delivering power, the other would be exhausting. This naturally would not require so heavy a flywheel to even the application of power. The work started in my shop on the farm. Then I was offered a job with the Detroit Electric Company as an engineer and machinist at $45 a month. I took it because that was more money than the farm was bringing me, and I had decided to get away from farm life anyway. The timber had all been cut. We rented a house on Bagley Avenue, Detroit. The workshop came along, and I set it up in a brick shed at the back of the house. During the first several months, I was in the night shift at the electric light plant, which gave me very little time for experimenting. But after that, I was in the day shift, and every night and all of every Saturday night, I worked on the new motor. I cannot say that it was hard work. No work with interest is ever hard. I am always certain of results. They always come if you work hard enough, but it was a very great thing to have my wife even more confident than I was. She has always been that way. I had to work from the ground up, that is, although I knew that a number of people were working on horseless carriages, I could not know what they were doing. The hardest problems to overcome were in the making and breaking of the spark and in the avoidance of excess weight. For the transmission, the steering gear, and the general construction, I could draw on my experience with the steam tractors. In 1892, I completed my first motor car, but it was not until the spring of the following year that it ran to my satisfaction. This first car had something of the appearance of a buggy. There were two cylinders with two and a half inch bore and a six inch stroke set side by side and over the rear axle. I made them out of the exhaust pipe of a steam engine that I had bought. They developed about four horsepower. The power was transmitted from the motor to the counter shaft by a belt and from the counter shaft to the rear wheel by a chain. The car would hold two people the seat being suspended on posts, and the body on elliptical springs. There were two speeds, one of 10 and the other of 20 miles per hour, obtained by shifting the belt, which was done by a clutch lever in front of the driving seat. Thrown forward, the lever was put in the high speed, thrown back, the low speed. With the lever upright, the engine could run free. To start the car, it was necessary to turn the motor over by hand with the clutch free. To stop the car, one simply released the clutch and applied the foot brake. There was no reverse, and speeds other than those of the belt were obtained by the throttle. 
I bought the ironwork for the frame of the carriage and also the seats and the springs. The wheels were 28-inch wire bicycle wheels with rubber tires. The balance wheel I had cast from a pattern that I had made and all of the more delicate mechanism I made myself. One of the features that I discovered necessary was a compensating gear that permitted the same power to be applied to each of the rear wheels when turning corners. The machine altogether weighed about 500 pounds. A tank under the seat held three gallons of gasoline, which was fed to the motor through a small pipe and a mixing valve. The ignition was by electric spark. The original machine was air-cooled, or, to be more accurate, the motor simply was not cooled at all. I found that on a run of an hour or more, the motor heated up, and so I very shortly put a water jacket around the cylinders and piped it to a tank in the rear of the car over the cylinders. Nearly all of these various features had been planned in advance. That is the way I have always worked. I draw a plan and work out every detail on the plan before starting to build. For otherwise, one will waste a great deal of time in makeshifts as the work goes on, and the finished article will not have coherence. It will not be rightly proportioned. Many inventors fail because they do not distinguish between planning and experimenting. The largest building difficulties that I had were in obtaining the proper materials. The next were with tools. There had to be some adjustments and changes in details of the design, but what held me up most was that I had neither the time nor the money to search for the best material for each part. But in the spring of 1893, the machine was running to my partial satisfaction and giving an opportunity further to test out the design and material on the road. End of chapter 1「Of My Life and Work」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marcetich, Alexandria, Virginia, June 2010. My Life and Work by Henry Ford in collaboration with Samuel Crowther. Chapter 2 what I learned about business. My gasoline buggy was the first, and for a long time, the only automobile in Detroit. It was considered to be something of a nuisance, for it made a racket and it scared horses. Also, it blocked traffic. For if I stopped my machine anywhere in town, a crowd was around it before I could start up again. If I left it alone, even for a minute, some inquisitive person always tried to run it. Finally, I had to carry a chain and chain it to a lamp post whenever I left it anywhere, and then there was trouble with the police. I do not know why, for my impression is that there were no speed limit laws in those days. Anyway, I had to get a special permit from the mayor, and thus for a time enjoyed the distinction of being the only licensed chauffeur in America. I ran that machine about 1,000 miles through 1895 and 1896, and then sold it to Charles Ainsley of Detroit for $200. That was my first sale. I had built the car not only to sell, but to experiment with. I wanted to start another car. Ainsley wanted to buy. I could use the money, and we had no trouble in agreeing upon a price. It was not at all my idea to make cars in any such pretty fashion. I was looking ahead to production, but before that could come, I had to have something to produce. It does not pay to hurry. I started a second car in 1896. It was much like the first, but a little lighter. It also had the belt drive, which I did not give up until some time later. The belts were all right, excepting in hot weather. 
That is why I later adopted gears. I learned a great deal from that car. Others in this country and abroad were building cars by that time, and in 1895 I heard that a Benz car from Germany was on exhibition in Macy's store in New York. I traveled down to look at it, but it had no features that seemed worthwhile. It also had the belt drive, and it was much heavier than my car. I was working for lightness. The foreign makers have never seemed to appreciate what light weight means. I built three cars in all in my home shop, and all of them ran for years in Detroit. I still have the first car. I brought it back a few years later from a man to whom Mr. Ainsley had sold it. I paid $100 for it. During all this time, I kept my position with the electric company and gradually advanced to chief engineer at a salary of $125 a month. But my gas engine experiments were no more popular with the president of the company than my first mechanical leanings were with my father. It was not that my employer objected to experiments, only to experiments with a gas engine. I can still hear him say, Electricity, yes, that's the coming thing, but gas, no. He had ample grounds for his skepticism. To use the mildest terms, practically no one had the remotest notion of the future of the internal combustion engine, while we were just on the edge of the great electrical development. As with every comparatively new idea, electricity was expected to do much more than we even now have any indication that it can do. I did not see the use of experimenting with electricity for my purposes. A road car could not run on a trolley, even if trolley wires had been less expensive. No storage battery was in sight of a weight that was practical. An electrical car had of necessity to be limited in radius and to contain a large amount of motive machinery in proportion to the power exerted. That is not to say that I held or now hold electricity cheaply. We have not yet begun to use electricity, but it has its place and the internal combustion engine has its place. Neither can substitute for the other, which is exceedingly fortunate. I have the dynamo that I first had charge of at the Detroit Edison Company. When I started our Canadian plant, I bought it from an office building to which it had been sold by the electric company, had it revamped a little, and for several years it gave excellent service in the Canadian plant. When we had to build a new power plant, owing to the increase in business, I had the old motor taken out to my museum, a room out at Dearborn that holds a great number of my mechanical treasures. The Edison Company offered me the general superintendency of the company, but only on condition that I would give up my gas engine and devote myself to something really useful. I had to choose between my job and my automobile. I chose the automobile, or rather I gave up the job. There was really nothing in the way of a choice, for already I knew that the car was bound to be a success. I quit my job on August 15, 1899, and went into the automobile business. It might be thought something of a step, for I had no personal funds. What money was left over from living was all used in experimenting. But my wife agreed that the automobile could not be given up, that we had to make or break. There was no demand for automobiles. There never is for a new article. They were accepted in much the fashion as was more recently the airplane. At first, the horseless carriage was considered merely a freak notion and many wise people explained with particularity why it could never be more than a toy. No man of money even thought of it as a commercial possibility. I cannot imagine why each new means of transportation meets with such opposition. There are even those today 
who shake their heads and talk about the luxury of the automobile and only grudgingly admit that perhaps the motor truck is of some use. But in the beginning, there was hardly anyone who sensed that the automobile could be a large factor in industry. The most optimistic hoped only for a development akin to that of the bicycle. When it was found that an automobile really could go, and several makers started to put out cars, the immediate query was as to which would go fastest. It was a curious but natural development, that racing idea. I never thought anything of racing, but the public refused to consider the automobile in any light other than as a fast toy. Therefore, later we had to race. The industry was held back by this initial racing slant, for the attention of the makers was diverted to making fast, rather than good, cars. It was a business for speculators. A group of men of speculative turn of mind organized, as soon as I left the electric company, the Detroit Automobile Company to exploit my car. I was the chief engineer and held a small amount of the stock. For three years, we continued making cars more or less on the model of my first car. We sold very few of them. I could get no support at all toward making better cars to be sold to the public at large. The whole thought was to make to order and to get the largest price possible for each car. The main idea seemed to be to get the money, and without authority other than my engineering position gave me, I found that the new company was not a vehicle for realizing my ideas, but merely a money-making concern that did not make much money. In March 1902, I resigned, determined never again to put myself under orders. The Detroit Automobile Company later became the Cadillac Company under the ownership of the Lelands, who came in subsequently. I rented a shop, a one-story brick shed, at 81 Park Place to continue my experiments and to find out what business really was. I thought that it must be something different from what it had proved to be in my first adventure. The year from 1902 until the formation of the Ford Motor Company was practically one of investigation. In my little one-room brick shop, I worked on the development of a four-cylinder motor, and on the outside, I tried to find out what business really was and whether it needed to be quite so selfish a scramble for money as it seemed to be from my first short experience. From the period of the first car, which I have described, until the formation of my present company, I built in all about 25 cars, of which 19 or 20 were built with the Detroit Automobile Company. The automobile had passed from the initial stage, where the fact that it could run at all was enough, to the stage where it had to show speed. Alexander Winton of Cleveland, the founder of the Winton car, was then the track champion of the country and willing to meet all comers. I designed a two-cylinder enclosed engine of a more compact type than I had before used, fitted it to a skeleton chassis, found that I could make speed, and arranged a race with Winton. We met on the Gross Point track at Detroit. I beat him. That was my first race, and it brought advertising of the only kind that people cared to read. The public thought nothing of a car unless it made speed, unless it beat other racing cars. My ambition to build the fastest car in the world led me to plan a four-cylinder motor, but of that more later. The most surprising feature of business, as it was conducted, was the large attention given to finance and the small attention to service. That seemed to me to be reversing the natural process, which is that the money should come as the result of work and not before the work. The second feature was the general indifference to better methods of manufacture as long as whatever was done 
got by and took the money. In other words, an article apparently was not built with reference to how greatly it could serve the public, but with reference solely to how much money could be had for it, and that without any particular care whether the customer was satisfied. To sell him was enough. A dissatisfied customer was regarded not as a man whose trust had been violated, but either as a nuisance or as a possible source of more money in fixing up the work which ought to have been done correctly in the first place. For instance, in automobiles there was not much concern as to what happened to the car once it had been sold. How much gasoline it used per mile was of no great moment. How much service it actually gave did not matter, and if it broke down and had to have parts replaced, then that was just hard luck for the owner. It was considered good business to sell parts at the highest possible price on the theory that since the man had already bought the car, he simply had to have the part and would be willing to pay for it. The automobile business was not on what I would call an honest basis to say nothing of being, from a manufacturing standpoint, on a scientific basis, but it was no worse than business in general. That was the period, it may be remembered, in which many corporations were being floated and financed. The bankers, who before then had confined themselves to the railroads, got into industry. My idea was then, and still is, that if a man did his work well, the price he would get for that work, the profits and all financial matters, would take care for themselves, and that a business ought to start small and build itself up and out of its earnings. If there are no earnings, then that is a signal to the owner that he is wasting his time and does not belong in that business. I have never found it necessary to change those ideas, but I discovered that this simple formula of doing good work and getting paid for it was supposed to be slow for modern business. The plan at that time, most in favor, was to start off with the highest possible capitalization and then sell all the stock and all the bonds that could be sold. Whatever money happened to be left over after all the stock and bond selling expenses and promoters charges and all that, went grudgingly into the foundation of the business. A good business was not one that did good work and earned a fair profit. A good business was one that would give the opportunity for the floating of a large amount of stocks and bonds at high prices. It was the stocks and bonds, not the work, that mattered. I could not see how a new business or an old business could be expected to be able to charge into its product a great big bond interest and then sell the product at a fair price. I have never been able to see that. I have never been able to understand on what theory the original investment of money can be charged against a business. Those men in business who call themselves financiers say that money is worth 6% or 5% or some other percent, and that if a business has $100,000 invested in it, the man who made the investment is entitled to charge an interest payment on the money, because if instead of putting that money into the business, he had put it into a savings bank or into certain securities, he could have a certain fixed return. Therefore, they say, that a proper charge against the operating expenses of a business is the interest on this money. The idea is at the root of many business failures and most service failures. Money is not worth a particular amount. As money, it is not worth anything, for it will do nothing of itself. The only use of money is to buy tools to work with or the product of tools. Therefore, Money is worth what it will help you to produce, or buy, and no more. If a man thinks that his money will earn 5% or 6%, he ought to place it where he can get that return.
but money placed in a business is not a charge on the business, or rather should not be. It ceases to be money and becomes, or should become, an engine of production, and it is therefore worth what it produces, and not a fixed sum according to some scale that has no bearing upon the particular business in which the money has been placed. Any return should come after it has produced, not before. Businessmen believed that you could do anything by financing it. If it did not go through on the first financing, then the idea was to refinance. The process of refinancing was simply the game of sending good money after bad. In the majority of cases, the need of refinancing arises from bad management, and the effect of refinancing is simply to pay the poor managers to keep up their bad management a little longer. It is merely a postponement of the day of judgment. This makeshift of refinancing is a device of speculative financers. Their money is no good to them unless they can connect it up with a place where real work is being done, and that they cannot do unless, somehow, that place is poorly managed. Thus, the speculative financiers delude themselves that they are putting their money out to use. They are not. They are just putting it out to waste. I determined absolutely that never I would join a company in which finance came before the work or in which bankers or financiers had a part. And further that, if there were no way to get started in the kind of business that I thought could be managed in the interest of the public, then I simply would not get started at all. From my own short experience, together with what I saw going on around me, was quite enough proof that business as a mere money-making game was not worth giving much thought to, and was distinctly no place for a man who wanted to accomplish anything. Also, it did not seem to me to be the way to make money. I have yet to have it demonstrated that it is the way, for the only foundation of real business is service. A manufacturer is not through with his customer when a sale is completed. He has then only started with his customer. In the case of an automobile, the sale of a machine is only something in the nature of an introduction. If the machine does not give service, then it is better for the manufacturer if he never had the introduction, for he will have the worst of all advertisements, a dissatisfied customer. There was something more than a tendency in the early days of the automobile to regard the selling of a machine as the real accomplishment, and that thereafter it did not matter what happened to the buyer. That is the short-sighted salesman, on-commission attitude. If a salesman is paid only for what he sells, it is not to be expected that he is going to exert any great effort on a customer out of whom no more commissions is to be made. And it is right on this point that we later made the greatest selling argument for the Ford. The price and the quality of the car would undoubtedly have made a market, and a large market. We went beyond that. A man who bought one of our cars was in my opinion entitled to continuous use of that car, and therefore if he had a breakdown of any kind, it was our duty to see that his machine was put into shape again at the earliest possible moment. In the success of the Ford car, the early provision of service was an outstanding element. Most of the expensive cars of that period were ill-provided with service stations. If your car broke down, you had to depend on the local repairman, when you were entitled to depend upon the manufacturer. If the local repairman were a four-handed sort of a person, keeping on hand a good stock of parts, although on many of the cars the parts were not interchangeable, the owner was lucky. But if the repairman were a shiftless person, 
with an adequate knowledge of automobiles and an inordinate desire to make a good thing out of every car that came into his place for repairs, then even a slight breakdown meant weeks of laying up and a whopping big repair bill that had to be paid before the car could be taken away. The repairmen were, for a time, the largest menace to the automobile industry. Even as late as 1910 and 1911, the owner of an automobile was regarded as essentially a rich man whose money ought to be taken away from him. We met that situation squarely and at the very beginning. We would not have our distribution blocked by stupid, greedy men. That is getting some years ahead of the story, but it is control by finance that breaks up service because it looks to the immediate dollar. If the first consideration is to earn a certain amount of money, then, unless by some stroke of luck, matters are going especially well, and there is a surplus over for service, so that the operating men may have a chance, future business has to be sacrificed for the dollar of today. And also I noticed a tendency, among many men in business, to feel that their lot was hard, they worked against a day when they might retire and live on an income, get out of the strife. Life to them was a battle to be ended as soon as possible. That was another point I could not understand, for, as I reasoned, life is not a battle, except with our own tendency to sag with the downpull of getting settled. If to petrify is success, all one has to do is to humor the lazy side of the mind. But if to grow is success, then one must wake up anew every morning and keep awake all day. I saw great businesses become but the ghost of a name because someone thought they could be managed just as they were always managed. And though the management may have been most excellent in its day, its excellence consisted in its alertness to its day, and not in slavish following of its yesterdays. Life, as I see it, is not a location, but a journey. Even the man who most feels himself settled is not settled. He is probably sagging back. Everything is in flux, and was meant to be. Life flows. We may live at the same number of the street, but it is never the same man who lives there and out of the delusion that life is a battle that may be lost by a false move grows, I have noticed a great love for regularity. Men fall into the half-alive habit. Seldom does the cobbler take up with the new-fangled way of soling shoes, and seldom does the artisan willingly take up with new methods in his trade. Habit conduces to a certain inertia, and any disturbance of it affects the mind like trouble. It will be recalled that when a study was made of shop methods so that the workmen might be taught to produce with less useless motion and fatigue, it was most opposed by the workmen themselves. Though they suspected that it was simply a game to get more out of them, what most irked them was that it interfered with the well-worn grooves in which they had become accustomed to move. Business men go down with their businesses because they like the old way so well. They cannot bring themselves to change. One sees them all about, men who do not know that yesterday is past, and who woke up this morning with their last year's ideas. It could almost be written down as a formula that when a man begins to think that he has at last found his method, he had better begin a most searching examination of himself to see whether some part of his brain has not gone to sleep. There is a subtle danger in a man thinking that he is fixed for life. It indicates that the next jolt of the wheel of progress is going to fling him off. There is also the great fear of being thought a fool. So many men are afraid of being considered fools. 
I grant that public opinion is a powerful police influence for those who need it. Perhaps it is true that the majority of men need the restraint of public opinion. Public opinion may keep a man better than he would otherwise be, if not better morally, at least better as far as his social desirability is concerned. But it is not a bad thing to be a fool for righteousness' sake. The best of it is that such fools usually live long enough to prove that they were not fools, or the work they have begun lives long enough to prove that they were not foolish. The money influence, the pressing to make a profit on an investment, and its consequent neglect of, or skimping of work and hence of service, showed itself to me in many ways. It seemed to be at the bottom of most troubles. It was the cause of low wages, for without well-directed work, high wages cannot be paid. And if the whole attention is not given to the work, it cannot be well directed. Most men want to be free to work. Under the system in use, they could not be free to work. During my first experience, I was not free. I could not give full play to my ideas. Everything had to be planned to make money. The last consideration was the work. And the most curious part of it all was the insistence that it was the money and not the work that counted. It did not seem to strike anyone as illogical that money should be put ahead of work, even though everyone had to admit that the profit had to come from the work. The desire seemed to be to find a shortcut to money and to pass over the obvious shortcut, which is through the work. Take competition. I found that competition was supposed to be a menace, and that a certain good manager circumvented his competitors by getting a monopoly through artificial means. The idea was that there were only a certain number of people who could buy, and that it was necessary to get their trade ahead of someone else. Some will remember that later, Many of the automobile manufacturers entered into an association under the Selden patent, just so that it might be legally possible to control the price and the output of automobiles. They had the same idea that so many trades unions have, the ridiculous notion that more profit can be had doing less work than more. The plan, I believe, is a very antiquated one, I could not see then, and am still unable to see, that there is not always enough for the man who does his work. Time spent in fighting competition is wasted. It had better be spent in doing the work. There are always enough people ready and anxious to buy, provided you supply what they want and at the proper price. And this applies to personal services as well as to goods. During this time of reflection, I was far from idle. We were going ahead with a four-cylinder motor and the building of a pair of big racing cars. I had plenty of time, for I never left my business. I do not believe a man can ever leave his business. He ought to think of it by day and dream of it by night. It is nice to plan to do one's work in office hours, to take up the work in the morning, to drop it in the evening, and not have a care until the next morning. It is perfectly possible to do that if one is so constituted as to be willing through all of his life to accept direction, to be an employee, possibly a responsible employee, but not a director or manager of anything. A manual laborer must have a limit on his hours, Otherwise, he will wear himself out. If he intends to remain always a manual laborer, then he should forget about his work when the whistle blows. But if he intends to go forward and do anything, the whistle is only a signal to start thinking over the day's work in order to discover how it might be done better. The man who has the largest capacity for work and thought is the man who is bound to succeed. I cannot pretend to say, because I do not know, 
whether the man who works always, who never leaves his business, who is absolutely intent upon getting ahead, and who therefore does get ahead, is happier than the man who keeps office hours, both for his brain and his hands. It is not necessary for anyone to decide the question. A ten-horsepower engine will not pull as much as a twenty. The man who keeps brain office hours limits his horsepower. If he is satisfied to pull only the load that he has, well and good, that is his affair. But he must not complain if another, who has increased his horsepower, pulls more than he does. Leisure and work bring different results. If a man wants leisure and gets it, then he has no cause to complain, but he cannot have both leisure and the results of work. Concretely, what I most realized about business in that year, and I have been learning more each year without finding it necessary to change my first conclusions, is this. 1. That finance is given a place ahead of work, and therefore tends to kill the work and destroy the fundamental of service. 2. That thinking first of money instead of work brings on fear of failure, and this fear blocks every avenue of business. It makes a man afraid of competition, of changing his methods, or of doing anything which might change his condition. 3. That the way is clear for anyone who thinks first of service, of doing the work in the best possible way. End of chapter 2